let me see. All right. So uh, to the group, uh, uh, just a quick introduction of Shardaji. Uh, uh, Shardaji was born in uh, India and she moved to the United States when she was 14. Now I'm getting a lot of this from her book, which I just uh, uh, completed. Uh, the, the name of the book is Home at Last. Um, now a few years ago, uh, she developed an interest in Reiki and this led her to practice meditation, which eventually became the passion of her life. She answered a spiritual calling and embarked on a unique journey of self-realization and enlightenment through many years of deep meditation. Over the years, Shardaji has continued to lead a normal family life, dedicating time towards um, philanthropic pursuits. And her mission is to help general public and advanced seekers by telling her extraordinary story and relaying authentic information about her experiences. Uh, Shardaji lives in, lives in um, Princeton, New Jersey, and on behalf of um, this entire group, I uh, extend a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Kishorji. Kishorji, that's very nice. Uh, actually, I'm really pleased to be with all of you today on your Gita session. <laughs> and I thank Kishorji for inviting me to join you all today. <laughs> I am... Um, I do these Zoom calls now. I used to. I usually travel a lot and uh, do these talks for a lot of Westerners. Mostly, uh, they're a little bit behind us in uh, you know in knowing a lot of these things, as we all know. But you know, we are all familiar with you know Gita and what the purpose of that uh, scriptures are, and we read and we do a lot of these Indians in general know a little bit more. I think you know. Uh, but knowing and uh, and reading and listening is one thing, and experiencing actually the directly uh, that whole thing that we read about getting tapping into our own uh, atma, our soul or consciousness, whatever you name you want to give it. I call it actually energy consciousness. You know, a lot of people call it soul. Uh, and then uh, Atma is one of those two Indians use a lot, right? Um, so uh, it's, uh, today I'm going to talk about how that whole process and how I was drawn into going through that process or experience, okay? Uh, so that you all will have an idea of what's it all about, you know? Uh, why is it that we have to go through that and what's that entail and uh, all these things. And you can ask me any questions you want later on. I'm just going to give you an overview of that since you not all you have read my book. Um, here is the book, Home at Last. I, uh, after I've gone through the experience, I wanted the purpose is as if uh, all my life is something within me, the insights were telling me what to do, when to do, because I never written a book in my life. And all of a sudden I came up with this book. Now, this is very interesting because everything that happened to me, I wrote it in here. <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, there's a reason for that. And there is a reason for me to kind of uh, educate people. And uh, a lot of people are confused when this thing happens to you because this experience will happen to every one of us, believe me. Uh, may not be when you want it, uh, it will happen to you as well, okay? And it might be this life, next life, what have you. I don't know, you know? I never thought it would happen to me in this life either. It just imposed on me. It was just kind of like uh, turned me around to a different direction in my life all of a sudden, which I will talk to you in a bit, in a minute. Um, so what I like to do today is like uh, first tell you a little bit about how I did with meditation practice, not through a lot of other practices that a lot of people undergo, you know, undertake. Uh, there's yoga, there's karma yoga, bhakti yoga, you know, millions of ways to get to learn that and connect back to the divine essence we all have within each other, right? And we have just forgotten instead of being that way, we have become something else, I think. <laughs> you know, instead of being uh, with our true nature and live this life, this, this 
so-called Maya or delusional life that God had created for us, we kind of gotten detached with that and uh, sort of living with this egoic consciousness. I think people develop that way of living and then they get so absorbed in this outer world and then get into all sorts of things. And uh, ultimately there comes a time when one realizes that that's, this is not real, it's just temporary. And we need to know what the life is all about. And that's exactly the way I felt when I you know, started moving forward in my life. Um, so to tell you how this whole thing started, I am uh, actually, let me tell you, first of all, I'm married. I have a husband. I have children, two daughters. <laughs> They're grown. Um, so it's nothing like it happens to only people like uh, sannyasis or, you know, brahmacharis, or you have to leave your kith and kin and go away to Himalayas. <laughs> Like some people think that, you know, there are a lot of people, men leave their wives and, you know, kids and they go away when, when it times to maybe they think that's best way. That's their choice. But it's not going to work. Believe me, I stayed exactly where I am with my family, did everything what I'm supposed to do and still continued on moving into the di different direction to gain what I'm you know, going towards. That's how it was for me. So never ignored what's in your plate. You can never can ignore what's given to you by divine. The responsibilities, the role you have to play, we have to continue doing best way we can possibly. That's the only way it'll work. If you think, you know, well, gee, I'm not gonna ignore doing this chore and that chore and this responsibility. I don't wanna be bothered with these people, with my family, whatever, and then start meditating and start doing because you're, you're obsessed with that and you wanna to get to the point, end point, it's not gonna work. That's what I realized. And uh, when I first started. So this whole thing started um, way back, uh, I like, uh, Kishorji is telling you, I, I actually, I came to US very young, uh, 13, 14 around there. My whole family's here. Um, then I grew up since they, then in this country. I did all my schooling and I went to college and then I started working in pharmaceutical company afterwards and I got married, everybody. I met an Indian guy, by the way. <laughs> so I'm married to an Indian man. Uh, I love India as far as uh, their, uh, spiritual way of thinking and people's way of uh, life is in general, they're always into want to learn your, you know, divine, want to be close to divine. In many ways, we all do that in India, right? Uh, but yet, there are a lot of these things, uh, you know, most of them I believe are bhakti yogis, they do pujas, rituals, this, that, a lot of these things uh, as their way of being and way of getting close to divine. But I feel that I think the best way to move forward is through meditation. And meditation is the highest spiritual practice one can undertake, and as opposed to other uh, practices we all go through, I think. You know, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, it's most direct and more uh, the fastest route. It's almost like taking a Concorde flight to some place you want to go, <laughs> as opposed to train, bus, and this and that, you know, <laughs> you go uh, right away to the place you want to be, and uh, it will work perfectly. At least it did for me. I, uh, it came to me, actually, meditation. I wasn't, I didn't have a teacher or a trainer, nothing like that. I uh, was doing, like um, Kishorji was saying, I got involved with the uh, um, Reiki for a while, as my husband had a heart attack, rather young age, and I, I, something turned me around and started thinking, you know, what can, can I do to help out or, you know, there got to be something else beyond the modern tech, you know, technology of doctors, medicines, you know, bypasses, this, that, they have to be divine energy or something that, that helps people, which is true, really, you know, all these man-made things in this world 
uh, in this life we lead. Uh, ultimately, actually, uh, divine energy, that prana is what you need, you know, to fix yourself or to, to heal yourself. So Reiki is one of them, actually, you, you absorb, I think you all know what Reiki is, you absorb the cosmic energy through your system, this physical, and pass it on, that pranic energy to heal somebody. I think that's what it is. Um, that's what I did, and that really interested me. Uh, in that Later on, um, it was that was one thing, and my husband was slowly getting better and everything, he got a bypass and all that, that's all gone, and I took care of it uh, for a while, uh, doing Reiki and this, and to recovery period. But later, it interestingly took me to meditation. You know, this is another thing that happens to every one of us. When it's your time to transcend and move into that direction, you will know there'll be a lot of signposts. There'll be a lot of uh, things that you will uh, get insights, you know, that there's something going on within you that is making you go into a different direction in your life rather than your routine day-to-day -day job and work. That's exactly how it went. And my thirst and my interest, suddenly my trajectory of life changes actually, you know, or something that making me inside constantly do something different. And that kind of interested me and I took upon uh, meditation deeper and deeper levels after a while. Um, again, I'm fast forwarding this whole thing because there's a lot to cover. Um, so I started meditating several years and uh, gotten better and better. Um, unlike other people, I didn't have a lot of these thoughts bombarding me and uh, disturbances and not wanting to meditate. All these things never happened to me. Some reason I was able to sit still, meditate into that quietude. It comes to me automatically and without you know, too many uh, thoughts and uh, issues of that majority of the people usually have that that's why they don't like meditation you know because meditation in, entails you to be uh steadily same time same place discipline yourself to do meditation every day which you have to do a lot of people don't and that's another thing too you have to stick with this you have to be very much into discipline you have to take care of this physical because if your physical is not uh, okay, you have issues with it, it won't work. And so you need to take care of your body. You need to take care of your health. You have to eat well, um, exercise, sleep well. You know, all these things must be done. Make sure your physical is energetic and good condition. Don't eat too much, don't eat less, don't starve. None of the above, you know, I wrote a big chapter on my, uh, my book, how you need to really take care of this physical, you know, what is it that you need to prepare it, because it entails a lot of work in the future, you know, as you go on in, in this, this path of self-realization. So all that I used to do. And uh, before I get to what happened next, there's, first of all, I need you to know, like I said, this is for every one of us, right? Not There's no special person that gets enlightened or self-realized or gets to this experience. It happens to, it's not a property of one, but for all of us. It's all, the only thing, thing is, it depends a lot on where we are in our evolutionary journey. We're all moving, evolving continuously. You know that, right? Like some people are down here, some people are middle, some people are up there. There, when your body, mind, intellect gets to a point where it's mature, then suddenly it's ready. All your inner selves, everything is balanced, everything aligned perfectly, and then it makes you unfold something within you by itself without any effort on your part starts telling you something is different that's how it, it happened to me so don't think it's for something special and then uh, you know and nothing to do with the religion what your beliefs are and nothing to do with what role you play or your education nothing no and no you know based on anything so make sure you remember that and also this is not something that happens just like that. It is a sequential unfoldment, three parts to it. 
It is not something that, oh yeah, one, two, three, I'm, <clears throat> I'm enlightened, I'm self-realized, I'm, oh, it's all great now, I'm better than other people. No, 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 no. It is a destructive, uh, messy business. I'm sorry to say, not mean to, uh, to discourage any of you and don't give up your spiritual practices because of that. <laughs> no, but when it comes to that time, everything you believe in, everything you believed, your interests, likes, dislikes, the way of perception of this world and this life changes from a normal reality of perception to it alters your way of life. You, it, it alters your perception of life, totally. So be ready for that one. And there's three parts, like I told you. First is called uh, awakening. You all must have heard that. What is awakening? It is, that's a starting point for the Kundalini energy to wake up, <clears throat> your inner energy. I think they call it here in Eastern country, uh, inner energy, and I call, we call it Kundalini. That must happen before anything, otherwise nothing happens. Kundalini has to wake up, and because that is needed, that much prana needed for the inside, that atma to go back to the universal consciousness or the source or the God or uh, divine energy. It has to meet that energy with the help of Kundalini. It only opens up when the individual is ready. Like I said, when it's time to transcend, it knows when to awaken. So never forcefully awaken that. A lot of people think that, oh yeah, I have to awaken my uh, Kundalini and they take this Kundalini yoga, this, that, and force it to open up. No, 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 never do that. It has to open by itself. When it's time, it'll do. So nothing like you're special. It'll open to you also when it is your time. So when you do uh, opening up that Kundalini, it'll, it'll give you a mess and you'll end up in a, in a mental hospital or you'll end up in a psychiatric uh, you know, observation. Don't, don't ever do that. And with that, uh, first step, um, there's a lot of issues as well you have to go through. That's why I said it's a steady process, takes a long time. And with that, I had gone through so many issues, uh, which I wrote about in my book, which I'll be briefly touch base with you guys later. Number two step, of course, in the process is called realizing your divine essence. You have to tap into the self that you all have within you which we are disconnected right now. It was enveloped with uh, this egoic consciousness or egoic way of energy or egoic layers of, it's we shut down our true nature and we are living with something else we built upon, you know, over the lives or over the time. <clears throat> That's why I say when the children are born, when they're babies, they, they come with that pure essence. Whereas we develop this, this other layers and dis, disconnect ourselves as we grow older and older. Um, so that's the second step. You have to tap into the self and realize, and the one indication there would be as you go deeper and deeper meditation, you will tap into that because it illumines. It will start lighting up. It will start bright light when you touch yourself. That's the indication you have touched it. You have seen it. You have felt it. There are a lot of these things you will know when you go through that stages, you know. Um, that first step is then you'll say, wow, what is this bright light? What is this sun as if it's facing on my face? That's, that's the quality of that self. It is bright. It is energetic. It knows it's there. We are embodying that energy within us. That's what keeps us moving. That's what keeps us going. That's what directs our life in general, you know? Of course, that uh, <clears throat> it is a small amount of prana before, but now with the Kundalini getting up, 100%, it will be there. That will cause, excuse me, <coughs> that will cause a lot of issues with the heat and a lot of energy you will be able to 
you know, get so confused what's going on with my life or it's like, you know, as if you have temperature of 106, you don't want to be bothered, you know, but it's not temperature. It is a different kind of a heat, different kind of a way of being. So you have to take it easy. And the only solution for that is to keep meditating, meditating, meditating. It'll take you deeper and deeper level of knowing that and that quietude without any effort on your part, it'll take you to different samadhi states eventually, you know? It'll take you <clears throat> much clean, much uh, deeper into that silence, which there is no way of identifying where you are sometimes, you know? You think you're at home, but you're not really. You keep continuing with that. That's the second step that goes on. And uh, the third <clears throat> and the ultimate process that will take place, which is a little bit faster than the other two, uh, is ultimate tapping into that finest fabric of consciousness, what I call the divine consciousness, that unification of that totality. Everything that you are here for is because of that universal consciousness, where everything springs from and eventually goes back into, right? I mean, we all crumb that, that universal consciousness and we go back and you need and you must get into that universal consciousness. You must experience that oneness of existence. You must experience that totality of everything where that um, oneness of existence, it, 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 you can feel it, that perfect unifying field. That's what I say it. In other words, it's not a, a figure or it's not a um, um, something like what we call God is there's no form to it. There's no um, seeing some kind of a thing. However, there's some places, sometimes you do see it, which I did, but I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, what you see mostly is uh, uh, emptiness, total emptiness, non-dual dimension. That's what I call it. It is no ending, no beginning. There is no time. There is nothing there. It's a total nothingness, a space of energy, flowing consciousness. It's just you become totally combined with that. That's the third step. And I know I can't explain enough. And I wrote as much as detail as possible in my book. So make sure you get a copy of that. Um, that is what is needed to call yourself, yes, you have tapped into a divine consciousness. That's what you call enlightenment. The time when you reach that point, totally, you lose, lose your outer consciousness. You don't know where you are. You have no clue. Uh, there is this, this thing exists even. And there is no clue of your physical. You lose the consciousness of this outer body, so-called body. As you know, body is really nothing but layers and layers of materialized awareness, actually. It's not even, you know, matter. It is, uh, <laughs> we, we don't know, we think this is our hand, this is our, you know, legs and this, that. This whole thing is a condensed energy, actually. You know, awareness, that's what it is. Even that you lose. And you lose your sense perception as well. You can't hear, can't see. Everything combines. It's like a river joining an ocean. I say that. You know, when you when that happens, it's just one thing. That consciousness eventually have to come back to this physical. If you're meant to come back, there are some yogis, some, some gurus, some teachers will tell you at that point, people leave actually the physical and then go away. But when you're meant to come back, you need to continue in this other side of coin, so-called life. And you need to go on with your life again until the time of yours comes to give up the body totally. And that's what happened. Um, and that's what I experienced. Um, and I, I give as much information as possible, but it's very difficult to talk about that uh, physically because it's just, <clears throat> and I might've stayed there at least, I don't know, several hours <laughs> when I was there and I fell down 
afterwards because my I'm meant to come back to this physical again. And uh, the strangest thing is I didn't want to come back. <laughs> I was back in this physical and the energy is back and I, I, I fell down because it was not integrated properly yet. All that consciousness, the different type of consciousness now you're with, you know, and you, everything seemed so different, so bad. In other words, that as if, well, what is it? Why am I here type of thing goes on for several, several months even after that. But slowly, slowly, you continue meditation, of course. You don't give up because that's your part of your life is to be in that dimension constantly. It's like a coin having two sides to it. You're always in that silence and absolute. And then you come back to this physical and get back to the normal routine that God has given you. The role playing has to be continued. And that takes a long time, which it took me uh, two years probably before I can settle down. I didn't want to be here. It's almost like uh, tasting nectar. And comparatively speaking, everything tastes terrible after that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't want to be here. <laughs> everything you want to, you lose your uh, interest in the world. What world has to offer? What, what is this? You know, you lose your desires. You lose your uh, likes and dislikes. You know, everything is different now. You're not accumulating. You're not here to accumulate money or, or wealth, what have you. It's just no interest in anything. Now you're a sannyasi. Now you're a brahmachari, <laughs> but you're still living. <laughs> like I feel that way at times I feel my kids are always getting annoyed with me because they always tell me to go let's go get this let's go buy this and I keep telling them no I don't need really anything I'm, I'm perfectly fine type of an attitude they get annoyed because they're not there yet right for them they don't understand what it means to live with desirelessness or likes or uh uh that is just a different way of living, you know? You don't really need anything because you have everything. That's how you feel. You have everything within you and you're perfectly in that perfect equanimity at all times. And that's the best part about it. And you continue living in this transcendental way of beingness, you know? You changed everything. You transcended beyond than you were before. So it gotta be good. And that's how a lot of gurus and teachers tell you, uh, self-realize. Why do you, why do they say that? Because you're supposed to live that way with your true nature rather than this egoic way of living. You know, then the life would be you using your full potential and you are far better in functioning well. And you are also uh, able to have your intention to do anything, you will succeed. There's a lot of positives about that. There are negatives as well, which I'm not gonna go in detail about that, but the positives overtake the negatives. I mean, yeah, it is difficult to live that way for some time, I'm, as I have. I'm depressed at times, and when the ego gets uh, gone, you know, practically, it's, uh, how do I say that? I'm trying to find the correct uh, word for that it dissolves I think I should say when the ego um, self-centered ego dissolves and you go through a lot of uh, disorienting for a while dis disorientation for a while I mean it becomes irritating you get mad you get depressed you know uh, as if you don't want to live here anymore it's just there's nothing excites you any longer and that's a bad part. I don't want to emphasize all those things because you have to work it out slowly, slowly. When your when your uh, meditations get better and better, you're always in that absolute silence automatically when you're meditating, and that will re release and that will integrate your way of life slowly into this world again. And that's exactly what's happening with me. Uh, I used to be terrible way back. <laughs> I, my husband used to get upset also a lot of times. And what's going on with you? You know, you're just always irritated, always. Because I, you don't actually see other people are not there. Therefore, it becomes difficult for you to adjust whenever they are in a different way of thinking, different way of speaking that irritates you sometimes. You know, well, what are they talking like that for? You know, this is the way it should be. So that becomes like, bad actually when you're integrating all that with your uh, kith and kin uh, but you know what you have to make the effort <clears throat> because the changes had happened to you not to them so you have to understand that and try to adjust 
yourself. And you can't expect everybody, your kids or your husband or your wife to understand <clears throat> the changes you have gone through. That's just not, doesn't work. So I realized that and I, uh, I tone it down in my way of being and I, I consciously made an effort to sort of blend in. Even you have to pretend sometimes, you have to blend in and you have to move on until your time comes, you know? And that's where I'm at at this point. I do a lot of uh, things uh, uh, now with helping other people through my talks and I do a lot of charitable organizations I belong to. I go to India, I go to Africa sometimes, I travel and I give out whatever I can. <coughs> Excuse me, but I'm getting, my throat is a little bit uh, acting up. So I'm gonna take a short break and tell you, um, I think just about I covered whatever I wanted to in a nutshell. I mean, it's not detailed by no means, but I prefer you buy this book. My, By the way, this one, uh, if you can get hold enough in the Amazon uh, and uh, online, you can contact me. You have my email, I'll mail you a copy or several copies so you can distribute among yourselves. Because my, my uh, publisher is not doing too well as far as marketing and distributing his thing with the COVID now, a lot of publishers doing really bad. <laughs> they're not able to function well they're not their staff is no good um he told me that so he sent me a lot of these my my own books back to me so i do whenever i give talks i give out i send out some books to to the groups and uh, so they can have a copy you will enjoy that book and also i give the oh by the way one more thing i forgot is uh during my uh, process i did connect with a teacher now, I'm not saying you all have to connect with teachers, you know, because some do, some don't. But it's good you connect with an uh, enlightened teacher that uh, drives your uh, path and helps you in your thing. But they don't give you self-realization. You work for it. You do all the work. They don't. No guru or no teacher can give you self-realization. We do that ourselves by working hard. By, by putting your complete effort, discipline, devotion, and desire has to be there. There's a lot of this thirst has to develop within you that you want to reach that point of knowing. And that must happen within ourselves. Nobody can do that. I happen to uh, resonate with the one teacher called Amma, Amma Karunamai. She is uh, from a South of India. Uh, I had resonated with her for some reason. Um, I wanted somebody from India, actually, a teacher. There are millions over here as well. You know, I, I connected with some of them here too at initial times when I was going through, but not really. I was mostly, everything was doing by myself. You know, I was meditating. My, my technique was Raj Yoga, by the way. Uh, focus and concentration in your Agna Chakra, the subtle energy center. It's called uh, Christ Consciousness Center command center and that will really subside all the thoughts disturbances calms you down right away if you focus here as opposed to other places people do you know and breathing exercises they do and other things they do right a lot of people and mantras I never did any of those things I was constantly focusing so that the focus the mind will think that oh this is where I'm supposed to go that's why you have to focus here and concentrate on that one object, one thing. It could be a lamp. It could be anything. And that's what you have to do. So I, uh, I had uh, contacted uh, the teacher that I was telling, telling you about. And I uh, dedicate all my proceeds of the book that I make to her. I, uh, I, I told her everything that she does so much uh, humanitarian projects all through the nation as well in India. She's established a lot of schools, hospitals, this, that. I always support her since then. You know, I always have been supporting her, especially any proceeds I get on this book, they go to her. And that's why I expose the books to educate, educate people. Also, uh, anything I make on those books, give it to her. Thank you. Um, now I'm open for anything you want to ask me. <laughs> Hey, uh, ma'am. Uh, good morning. My name is Uday Shri Ram. I'm uh, I'm uh, in India right now. I'm in Hyderabad. 
I bought your book. I started reading. I should say I haven't finished it. I'm about 45% through. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, you know, thank you so much for uh, taking this on to yourself to educate people who are on the path on what the journey looks like, right? Because you're right. We don't we don't get to hear such gory details, if you will, right, from uh, the gurus and enlightened beings that uh, we have had opportunities to interact with, right? Uh, so thank you so much for uh, doing this for us. And uh, yeah, I am really, really uh, thrilled uh, reading the details. One, uh, one thing that was, I just couldn't place myself, ma'am, is the timeline, right? Like, uh, when was it that you met uh, Amma Karuna Mai? Uh, you know, was it after realization, before realization? And did you go through your realization process after initiation by uh, by the guru uh, that you... Uh, so I just wanted some timeline, ma'am, if you don't mind. Of course, yes. Um, no, the answer is no, I didn't meet her right away. Uh, my whole process took almost nine years eight to nine years, okay? Uh, I started meditating, I got better and better and I loved it. And I think I met her after my first uh, awakening, after the, my Kundalini got awakened. I got so many problems, you know, maybe not too much to a point where uh, Gopi Krishna, if you heard of him, uh, he had a lot more issues and a lot more problems with Kundalini awakening. Uh, mine was not that bad, I could handle them maybe because I was in good, good condition as well. Uh, through, and I, like I said, deeper meditations will subside some of those issues eventually. Uh, so I was able to handle them. So I think I met her after my, um, all these issues are coming about. I was totally confused. I read hundreds of books those days. And, but I still wanted to meet somebody and talk to them, you know, exactly what's going on. I want to have a dialogue with them, you know. So this lady, uh, Amma, was giving a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. A lot of gurus don't let you come near them even, let alone having a dialogue. <laughs> so this lady offered, uh, used to come to U.S. and uh, meet people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and talk their problems or talk to, the, to her directly. And that really interested me. And that's why I met her uh, way late, later on. I would say three quarters I'm there already, actually. There's no such thing like uh, a guru initiated me or anything like that, okay? My Kundalini was awakened. Everything was going okay. Then I met her first time. What the first word she said was, I was waiting for you. I was thinking, when are you going to come and meet me? As if these people knew some of these souls will come to them, you know, some of these individual souls, when they're about to transcend, they'll meet certain gurus, you know, and that's exactly happened to me. And I didn't know when she said that, why she's saying I'm supposed to meet her at that time. And she was explaining to me, I know you will come to me because you're going to be, you know, be united with the universal consciousness soon. You're on your way. Uh, I, uh, in your last birth, you're a meditator, but you can succeed. So in this life, you're uh, moving forward very nicely. That's what she said to me. And I was like stunned <laughs> how she knew all that information about me. And that's really made me stay with her all the time and connect with her. Um, we had so many conversations after that about my status and my beingness, uh, how I'm moving within my chakras, my energy is moving toward, you know, all these subtle energy centers, your Kundalini will move through Sahasrara eventually to the top right? Uh, that's what happened. And she uh, was there for me all the time. I, I'm not saying uh, because of her being and her well wishes and uh, she wished and probably made it faster too. And I think so, you know, and which is a good thing. These gurus have uh, capacity to, to help you uh, clean up your mess so you can move faster without any hurdles, in other words, but they don't give it to you on in your plate. You have to work towards so yes, I did meet her later on. And uh, that's why I love her. And I always uh, support her with everything. And my book is uh, published in India as well. Good thing you got it from there. Yes, it's uh, published in three different countries, Canada, US, and India as well. Manjul published. Thank you, ma yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. If you have any questions, you feel free to uh, email me. You have my email address as well. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> you, you go ahead, please. 
uh, thank you, uh, Kishore. Uh, Sharda ji, thank you for a wonderful uh, talk and sharing your experience. Um, I have also had the question about the timeline, uh, but slightly different one. I was just wondering when you talked about three stages, if you can talk a little bit more about um, you know, how, uh, how long did it take during your nine years journey in each of these stages? And relatedly, you know, you talked about that in the first stage, it was all about uh, Kundli getting awakened. Uh, so I'm just curious if Reiki helped you get to that stage or um, it just happens or, um, you know, you, one has to do something to um, get those Kundlis going. Kundalini is uh, uh, getting uh, awakened. Thank you. Okay, good question. Um, actually, you know what? I feel that Reiki also helps you because for Reiki to function well, all your inner subtle energy centers have to be cleaned out. You know what I'm saying? So that energy can be absorbed mm -hmm. through your centers. It goes within you and channel it out into your physical with your hands and the energy goes towards the energy to heal somebody, right? Now that wouldn't be happening unless if there's obstructions and blockages within your system to begin with, I think, you know? So I think Reiki probably helped me. Um, my meditation's very good, you know? Eventually Reiki practitioners can become self-realized actually, I believe strongly because if they mm -hmm. pursue uh, meditation later on and if they go into deeper and deeper levels of doing meditation they can transcend but a lot of reiki practitioners probably don't do that i don't know um yes it does help you and but then again my effort toward meditation helped me a lot more you know me let alone reiki that's fine after a while i let it go because i wasn't emphasizing on reiki anymore i mean however mm -hmm. i do do that now once in a while, if I need to, if anybody, uh, you know, needs it, but I don't, I never made that as a practice for sure. Uh, that it was as if uh, it's a prerequisite for me when getting into meditation, that's how it happened to me. So mine all in all, yes, it took uh, eight to nine years because uh, I felt most of the time, first two couple of years, it was that Kundalini business that I went through uh, that took more time, you know, to settle down that, that energy, the heat, that not able to sleep in the night, the ag agitations <clears throat> I used to have, I had to get up in the middle of the night, walk around for a while because the heat and energy are more in the night when the body is in resting phase, uh, as if it works up, you know, when we're active, it doesn't, you don't feel it as much, but when you're resting stage, the inner energy gets all, you know, moving around and exposing all that energy and heat gets to be annoying after a while. Uh, it used to bother me so much uh, when I couldn't sleep, uh, actually, because uh, the heat was generating too much and my hands used to be cherry red and my feet and my body, I felt so uncomfortable. And I used to deal with that for a long time uh, slowly, slowly, uh, it, it did reduce. Even today, I, I live with that energy because my consciousness is different now. You know, the Kundalini is still there, right? Actually, it's integrating into my daily life now. It's there. Once the Kundalini is awakened, you are living with that pranic energy of full blown. And that's why it's much better because you can help others as well. That, that uh, vibrates outside. Whoever is close to me, they feel better, they feel good. They, they can feel that energy sometimes. A lot of people say that. My own children say that to me, you know, mom, when I'm with you, I feel so good for some reason. Now, why do they say that, you know? <laughs> they, they, I feel uh, that it gives out. And even my husband feels better when, I, when he's with me because uh, he says, you know, I can feel your energy, he says. So it's really, um, it takes, it's not completely anymore, heat and energy doesn't go away it stays with you but it's it it integrates much better you're a much better person now handling all that functioning well that's what it is great thank you so much and uh, I, i'm going to buy your book in india as well and uh, i'm glad it's available here i did not know that um, yeah. so i'm going to buy a copy and then look forward to interacting with you offline thank you so much you're welcome <laughs> krishna please go ahead Hi, Namaste. Uh, I'm Krishna. Thank you so much for doing this talk. So I got your book and I'm like about... 
Are you also from India? Yes, you're in India? Uh, no, I am in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh, you're in San Francisco. I got it through Kindle, so. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am, all of us got, me and I got it through Kindle, actually, so it was much easier. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of people like it because I have a lot of photos in here, a lot of, uh, it's this publisher did a one. I will get it. Uh, because he did, I, I asked him to uh, put in a lot of photos too. When I was uh, moving, uh, I traveled a lot to meditate in different places, you know, to Ramana Maharshi Ashram and to Ganges. I went there meditating. Yes, and I did. Buddha, where he and got enlightened, I went there to meditate. I, it was as if something was driving me toward these places to uh, enhance your meditation, you know. In those places, the energy field is far better and that sort of helps you lift up and move forward faster. So there are a lot of photos about that as well in the book. Um, what was your question? I'm sorry. Oh, Go ahead. Uh, sure, yeah. So my question was um, like in this group, we are primarily taking Bhagavad Gita's scripture and we are going through that. Uh, we went through one book and then we are doing another book. Uh, in your book, like I have probably read about 50-60% of it. I didn't see uh, much mention of uh, reading the, the scripture part, like at least the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads part and how that kick started something like a lot of us here uh, started with one of the scriptures and that kind of kick started our interest more into this spiritual journey and through that we got to learn about uh, the Ashtanga yoga system and then the various other different types of yoga that you just mentioned and uh, so following that we are kind of working through our way through the scriptures and it prescribes the karma yoga dhyana yoga and all the various parts so I was wondering if you uh, read through any of the Upanishads or something and if that, how did you integrate that part into your whole spiritual journey? Very good question because a lot of people uh, wonder about that as well. And uh, it's interesting you mentioned that today. My path, I never read any scriptures. I did not read anything until you know, recent, when I started doing all these meditations, I, I did not, I'm not into uh, reading scriptures, doing pujas or ritualistic activities, by the way. My path was totally, I bypassed all that. It sort of uh, took me to that point of knowing automatically without my reading books on, you know, previous scriptures or Upanishads or whatever. I never even knew they existed. I never even bothered reading because I wasn't interested. All my knowledge came through my experience. All my knowledge and understanding, anything that Gita says, everything that when I look at now, that I experienced it, you know? Uh, Gita, Krishna talking to Arjun about all these things, you know, process one step at a time. He explains to Arjun, everything I had experienced it already and I knew it and I, that's another thing happens once you get self-realized, there's an understanding beyond and above that's steadfast. You don't need to read a book that will stay with you for good. And that's the one that alters your way of beingness. You, you are totally a different being now with that understanding why you're staying here, why you're living in this world. What is this Maya, you know, what is this temporary, stay called life that we're here for what are reincarnations why do we come back constantly all these things there's a deep understanding about that when you go through the experience that's why it's a must we have to experience and go through the direct and maybe because i was a meditator in my last life i got into a like i told you i i bypassed all those other uh things and i went right to the uh process of knowing directly uh, in my case, not all. I'm not saying everybody, you know, they do read, they do help all these scriptures and everything. But for me, after I experienced it, I read them and they're all like saying the same thing that I already know. <laughs> so then I said, oh, that's right. That's what happened to me. I kept thinking. So I started reading later, actually, much later. Uh, that's the uh, reason I think uh, in my case. Even today, I never... Uh, uh, strictly follow any kind of a rules or regulations, by the way. My life was something like really funny. I, I never paid attention to what uh, everybody uh, does. 
I did it, everything, whatever my insight told me, you know. I never sat in lotus position to meditate. I used to sit in this little stool with my legs comfortable, my physical comfortable, as long as I'm straight, back straight, so that energy can move through your shushumna, you know, everything. I had given that information within me and I never think, uh, oh, because so-and-so told me I have to do this. I never did that. I decide on what, how it is good for me. And I did it and it worked. So there is no rules and regulations really in general, actually one has to follow. Whatever makes you comfortable and you're doing it correctly, that's fine. It will take you there eventually. That's what I think. Uh, just a, no, thank you. a follow up, uh, thank you, Krishna. Um, a wonderful question there. So just a quick follow up on that. I mean, so were you curious after you were self-realized to go back and, and read the Upanishads to where they explain the same, uh, the, those, the non-dual state that you explained uh, earlier. Were you curious to go back and see, hey, are they, did they talk about the same thing that I experienced? I'm just curious to hear if you- I did, I did actually. <laughs> In fact, I read um, just recently some Bhagavad Gita, somebody else gave me a new version of it or something, I was reading it. Uh, yeah, it, it, a lot of these things, something that I already know, for some reason, you know, somebody, uh, something already, I've done it. I, I've been there, in other words, in that, that perfect, serene field of no thing, you know, like I said, that consciousness is nothing like a, a figure, you know. Sometimes, however, you do see in deep meditations, a blue light. When you read my book, I explained it better. Uh, you will see uh, a deep yellow in the middle, surrounding about three of them with the blue, blueness. It, it comes to you when you're meditating as if divine energy or divine consciousness telling me, ha, ah, you're with me now, or you are connected with me now. And I, I used to feel that way when I, some people do get some, you know, images sometimes, you know, uh, but the only thing I used to get is that blue light a lot of times. Other people say different things, but I don't know what other people see or feel. But in my case, uh, I used to see, even today when I meditate, I'm always there. I'm always in that blue light. So it is a excellent feeling of knowing that you're united with divine consciousness and you have ended that process of cycle of birth and rebirth. By the way, when you self-realize and you are enlightened, no more births. You don't come back into this form any longer. End of the cycles, no reincarnations. That's the best part about life. So that's the ultimate process of human evolution. That's the ultimate purpose of our existence. To connect back, then you've finished everything, right? Why do you think otherwise we come back constantly over and over, life, death, life, death, all these reincarnations are happening. Think about it, right? because we haven't finished everything and we haven't connected with the divine consciousness yet. That's the reason. You must do that as long as you're playing this game of life. We have to connect back. It's almost like God is testing us. Who will come back to him first? You know, Are they going to be going after this worldly thing? So be in the world, but not of the world. That's what I say. <laughs> you know, be in the world. Do everything. No, no restrictions. But don't get carried away with the worldly things. And also you, you lose your desires anyway, eventually. They're all gone. I think so, there's a quick, quick question for my wife, Preeti. I think you Hello, spoke Sharda, Sharda Ji. Namaste. You know, you're such a gorgeous, beautiful and energetic person. Did this <laughs> path, you know, seriously, um, you know, um, did this path help in that? Uh, Say that again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're such a gorgeous, beautiful and energetic person. I really feel, uh, you know, the energy and the you yeah. and the beauty. And really, I'm saying, um, did this path help in uh, that? Or, you know, you're always that I know, but did this also, like my mother, she's into meditation, suddenly she's, she glows and she's said, mom's in the path. So I'm, you know, it's a kind of, uh, yeah. Is there a connection between the physical outlook and looking young and yeah, and yeah. like you're like my Gautam who's 16, you know? <laughs> that, that kind of I get that energy. So that's it that did this help, please. Is it your name Priti, right? You're Priti. Priti, yes. Priti, yes, I talked oh, to you. Thank yes. you. 
<laughs> yes, you're right, 100%. Um, a lot of people commented that on me. I know that I, my energy kind of like spreads around, which is true, which is true. You know why? Because I carry that. I carry full amount of that, that inner energy blown. You know, I have, in fact, I can't sit around and watch television all the time. I'm always moving around doing things. I take walks in the nature. I play tennis, by the way, even now. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, of course, I give all these talks everywhere. I travel. I have to do things with my inner energy because it's really telling me to, to go do things. I have that enthusiasm. I'm not a dull person. I'm not a quiet person. Uh, when people are with me, they love it because I talk to them. I, I tell them things and, uh, you know, I love it. But that's just it. And also, by the way, when you're in a higher dimension of that energy field, you know, the frequency of energy changes. Uh, therefore, your aging reduces because you don't age as fast. I'm very old, actually. I have two great uh, two kids, and uh, you know I've been around. Believe me, but I don't look that uh, old yet <laughs> because of that energy field. I, I have a higher energy vibrational frequency as opposed to normal people. You know what I'm saying? And that's another advantage of being self-realized when the Kundalini wakes up. Because the closer you are to universal consciousness, the energy fields, the vibrations increase tremendously, and you stay with that later. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rajiv, uh, you're up next. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Kishore. Thank you, Shardaji. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for such a wonderful talk. And very few people talk about the struggle along the path and uh, dark night of the soul or whatever you call it you know and what kind of hell people have to go through i'm so glad that you brought it up so i have one question and it is just it has uh, you know a uh, very simple and straight question is that i mean when when you're starting out you always like to have a teacher mentor guru maybe with lineage you know whom you can go back to so what sort of drove you to you know find your own path because you said raj yoga but you know, doing it yourself. And the second dimension to that question is that when you were going through that lower ebb, you know, and you had no guru to hold your hand or to bail you out. So what kept you going and giving you the courage and conviction that you were on the right path? So two dimensions, but the similar question, you know, why did you start out? Why did you choose to start off without a guru? And how did you sort of come out when you were in your low you know, with somebody without some being somebody there to pull you out. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Good question. R listen, uh, remember what I told you that uh, not, gurus are not needed for everybody. I mean, uh, some people go without guru. Ra Ramana Maharshi never had a guru, I don't think. I don't remember now, but something, some, a couple of gurus knew. Um, I went on my own for a long period of time because I didn't think there's any gurus as such even that, you know, that, that will take me to. I initial times when I first started uh, meditating, when I first started Reiki, Reiki and all that, uh, I didn't really think they were anything. But remember, I started um, <clears throat> looking into gurus way after I meditated for several years. And then I, I wanted to meet somebody and talk to somebody. And that's when I met Amma. Right. Until then, I used to meet once in a while some of these American gurus or teachers, uh, Adi Ashanti and other people that are, in, uh, I think, uh, even San Francisco Bay Area. You must have heard him. He's a very good uh, uh, American, became a Buddhist monk and teaches now, Adi Ashanti. He's a good friend of mine, actually. I talk to him a lot. Um, and also, I know a lot of other people briefly uh, used to see what they have to say, but nothing in deep, you know, wanting them to do anything for me type of thing. No, I'm curious to see what they have to say more. That's why I used to go to them sometimes and listen to their talks and things like that. So I didn't really uh, look into it. What made me get into even Amma eventually is my conversation. I want to really have a dialogue and explain all the issues I'm having. Is that normal? Is that what's going on? Why is it? And I want her confirmation somebody enlightened beings in this life, you know, in the earth that come to uplift human consciousness, all these gurus, teachers, good ones. I'm not talking about 
fake ones, good ones, real ones. <laughs> there are a lot of fake ones, so be aware of that. Um, so uh, that's one thing. So, and also, like I said, my previous life, I was a meditator, don't forget, a deep meditator that kind of passes through in this life. You know, there's some things that you left out comes to a completion. Maybe that's why my intention and my thirst, my, my drive was so big, so much within me. I had to find out. I have to know what this is taking me toward. I have to know where am I going? Where's the end point to this? What is it that I'm trying to find out? What is it that I'm trying to experience? That type of uh, questioning, that type of uh, eagerness started developing within me for a long period of time. And that's what made me go ahead and, uh, and, and even the yoga, uh, the Raja Yoga came as if it's meant for me. It was given to me that type of uh, meditation technique. I didn't go for a teacher to learn that. It automatically, I used to sit there and focus in my middle of my two eyebrows for some reason. Now, who taught me that? This is what I'm saying. There's a lot of divine intervention takes place, okay? There's a lot of, as if God is helping you with all these things when you're ready. That's what happens. All the signposts, the drive, the interest develops within you. You don't need to have a teacher, really, you know? That itself will take you to move you forward. That's what happened. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lakshmi, uh, please go ahead. Uh, and I hope um, uh, you're okay with time, Shardaji. Just want to be... Definitely. I'm, I, I took off half a day just for you guys. <laughs> I would love to meet all of you one time in San Francisco Bay. I go there. I used to go there a lot before. Okay. Yeah. Time maybe when we'll get in touch. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Lakshmi, please go ahead. I think you're muted, uh, Lakshmi. Lakshmi, you're muted. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, namaste, Sharda Ji. I'm so privileged to uh, be in this class today with you, actually, with everyone. Where are, um, you, where are you calling me? Tell me, identify for after that. Tell me, are you India or here? <laughs> I'm an Indian living in Boston. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> close to me. <laughs> yes. Close. Yeah, yeah, close to you. Okay. Um, and thanks for all the work you do for the world, your service. Um, it, I have two questions. One is, um, how did you had to change your foot habits uh, for the smooth flow of energy throughout your body? The other question is, you were talking about your stage three, right? Which is the ultimate stage. And you were there for a few hours there. How were you able to come back? Like, did anything help you? And that's a, I've heard, I didn't experience what I've heard that it's always difficult to come back to the world um, unless there's some sort of guidance. Okay, very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, first one you asked me was, now I lost track. What was the first the, one? The food habits. Did oh, you have to change your eating habits so yeah. that it helps you to meditate well and open up your chakras? Definitely, definitely. What you eat is what you are. You must have heard that saying, you know? How you are depends a lot of times what you put in into this system, you know, especially uh, when you're going through this process, a lot of things don't sit well with your system, the meat and this and that. By the way, meat is not a good thing to eat while at least during the duration of this, this pack, you know, because the energy is being used up in digesting that meat. Meat takes longer and a lot of energy to digest as opposed to vegetarian, you know, vegetables, fruits, whatever, right? So you don't want to use up the energy that you have before Kundalini awakens in that little energy we do have, little prana we do have in, in place of filling up your stomach with a lot of food and a lot of meat. And then you don't want to meditate. You don't want to even do anything. That energy is not being used to lift yourself up, to move forward. So that's number one. Don't eat stuff uh, that takes a lot of energy out of you initially. 
And also even afterwards, you have to maintain your food habits a lot, that's what I did, you know? I realized, like I told you, discipline of health and discipline of taking care of yourself became a priority for me along with others. Uh, because like I said, there's this insights of me keep telling me what to eat, what not to eat, you know? Those things came to me for some reason. I could not eat a lot of quantities. I have to reduce the quantity. I never ate a lot of quantity anyway. I'm not a heavy person. <laughs> I usually eat a little bit anyway. Uh, even that, I couldn't handle it when, when my started uh, energy opened up, even Kundalini opened up. It, it didn't sit well. Uh, so I used to sit with uh, mostly fruits, vegetables, and uh, very little, uh, oh yeah, dairy products, milk, glass of milk, yogurt, things like that. So that, that did good to me. So listen to your system. What fits you? What is well taken within you? It depends on each constitution. It varies with each one of you. You know, it depends. Like with me, nothing sat with me unless I ate only vegetables and fruits and things like that. Very little rice, maybe a roti one day, you know, something like that. I used to reduce everything. And if I'm not hungry, by the way, no eating. Never eat when you're not hungry. When your system requires, it lets you know. It needs some food. By the way, after a while, after self-realization, you lose all that also because you have all this prana within you. It sustains with you. You don't need outside food. I Now, you know how many times I eat? Once. I drink uh, juice in the morning. In fact, I can even skip the meal in the night. I don't even get hungry anymore. I am good. But I eat uh, nuts, a lot of nuts, almonds and things like that. I like that. Um, but my intake is very limited now. And my husband gets mad at me all the time because I'm not eating properly. In his mind, I should be eating properly, this, that. I keep telling him, but he doesn't listen. Uh, we go through that anyway. Anyways, so that's how it is. Um, the second question you have is, uh, when I went to the final stage, how did I know to come back to the body? Uh, I didn't know. It tells you, the divine knows. It knows, it makes me wake up my eyes. It wakes me open because it comes back to the physical eventually with that space, with that togetherness, that oneness, that, that dimension of energy comes back to this system eventually because you're meant to live. You're meant to continue with your tasks or your activities again for some time until maybe you're spending things to do for you still. You can't take off. I wish I did, but uh, no, <laughs> I had to come back and slowly. So it told me when to open my eyes. I did open my eyes, but I felt totally disoriented where I was, what's going on. I, I couldn't feel, slowly I felt my hands and uh, it took me a while. Like I said, I fell down when I opened my eyes from my chair or the stool I was sitting in on my grass, you know, in my backyard. I did all my meditations in the nature, by the way. I always go out into the nature that I used to do my meditations, not indoors for some reason. I mean, if it's to totally bad outside, okay, fine. But so uh, it took me a while to get up and, and then I, I knew deep down all this is what's going on because like I told you, you get all this knowledge of what happened, you know, that you did make, unite with the consciousness, the total totality of divine consciousness. And you know, now it has to come back into this physical. You know everything. You, you do, there's nothing you don't know anymore. You, you can handle your own things well. And that's how it felt. It took me a while. I didn't go back into the house until maybe an hour, or <laughs> an hour and a half, but sitting around with all these issues. And my, while my family, my, my husband was probably waiting. He watches TV and he's, he's absorbed with his own things. So. Uh, finally, I came back and, uh, you know, I felt very disoriented, just very disoriented, but still I didn't want to do any work that normally I do. Took me a while, several days, but but I, I didn't make it. I used to make believe I'm okay. I never told anybody, especially my husband, all the details, but he knew later on that I was transcendent. He knew the amount of meditations I was doing and and things that changes I have. Uh, shown he he knew he's a well-read man so he he knows so not everybody by the way can transcend at the same time just because you're transcending doesn't mean your husband is or your kids are everybody has their time you know so like I said before we all have to adjust 
and, and live your life again. That's uh, if you don't mind, I, I have one more question. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I know you have kids and of course they're grown up, but did you have to, when you talk to them, do you talk to them about your experiences and how do they take, uh, how do you, how do you educate, do you feel the urge of educating them? <laughs> though though they, they may not be ready, right? How, how do you? Yeah, that's, that? uh, that's a good question. Um, that's true. No, I don't impose my children or anybody. I learned that in a you know, different way. Uh, they think I'm preaching otherwise all the time. You know, I'm pushing them to do. No, you have to leave them alone. Like I said initially in my talk, everybody is evolving in a certain certain pace you know there comes time when they realize they need to meditate or they need to do some spiritual practices or read spiritual books it's up to them are they at that level yet that's them to decide and that's divine to tell them or they will know so i didn't really uh, say anything but they read my book <laughs> when the book got published my daughters both of them read my book and they were amazed and then they start asking me questions, mom. And then they know mom meditates a lot. You know, that's about it maximum. And she she's very, uh, and my kids now do know what self-realization is. I did explain a few things to them. Um, and they, they understood better because they're grown up now. They understand. Uh, they do try to meditate now on their own at times, and uh, but not as good yet, but they'll get there. So I'm okay. My husband meditates by himself and he's a Yogananda devotee uh he knows certain a lot of things but he hasn't been transcended yet he hasn't gone through the process his time will come who knows later on you know thank you very much and i i will try to keep in touch with you and i would love to definitely you have my email address you can always thank you contact me with any questions uh raj uh, would you like to <laughs> vp i hope it's okay raj and uh, ajay go in the way Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm coming from my second one, so I can do it. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, very insightful and helpful, Sardaji. Thanks a lot uh, for the talk. Actually, uh, Lakshmi's last question was my question. Uh, so you already answered it. Um, okay. Uh, uh, while she was asking that question, I was thinking of uh, uh, something else. Uh, came into my mind. So I asked that question now. I was going to ask about how you uh, manage uh, these things, your, your findings and your, um, your journey with, with your family. Um, at the same time, we have all these other uh, faiths and beliefs that people have. Um, so we, we call them religion or, uh, you know, uh, different different types of gurus and uh, uh, the Bible and Quran and and things like that. So how do you actually, if if we were talking uh, with each other and I had this other belief on you know biblical beliefs, for example, how how do you reconcile with that? That that's what came to my mind when when Lakshmi was asking about uh, the family. Uh, with other people in general, right? Uh, oh, how, how do I handle who's... other people's religious beliefs and this and that? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, you know, first of all, I don't believe in any religion per se. I, I think they're all man-made, right? I mean, they're created. As long as, especially now that I'm self-realized more, I feel that uh, I understand everything a lot more than any religion can give me that information. The ultimate point is in every religion to reach divine essence, correct? Any, any, any book you say, any religions, eventually that's what they all are after. So I, I, when I speak with people and uh, uh, their discussion, let them discuss and I don't intervene too much unless they ask me a question or anything like that. And uh, I maintain my uh, balance and What's the use in discussing and disagreeing or teaching them when they uh, set in ways, you know, a lot of Buddhists think they're, they're just, you know, they're there. I know Christians, especially Christianity. Jesus is the God, you know. They're, a lot of these things, they're, they're very well set in their minds. I'm not here to uh, erase that or nor fix them in any way. So I keep it neutral, you know. 
Let them, when it's time, they will go through this uh, experience. They will realize what it is uh, that religion they headstrong about is nothing but an understanding, actually, that you are back with the universal consciousness, you know? And when their time comes, they'll know. But so I don't really indulge in any kind of uh, those type of conversations too much myself, as I know a lot more in depth myself by experiencing all that. So why bother uh, into a discussion about that, you know? I don't. Yeah, yeah, and and people are, are not asking you about that, like like I am asking you right now. Yeah, uh, they don't ask me like that. I mean, they are they. Most of my friends, most of people now that this book is very popular, a lot of people have read my book, <laughs> so they get in touch with me for other questions, like you guys mm -hmm. are asking. Um, they email me, they call me, they for Zoom talks, you know, things like that. Then I explain a lot more. And I believe really, uh, I know you're saying a lot of people don't even open up and tell all these things. I think there's nothing to hide. We're all in it together. We must educate each other. We must, if somebody has transcended and self-realized, what is there to hide that experience, all the details? I think I feel free to give them that information. So they'll be prepared when it's their time. Because we're all in it, it's all in one package. You know, we're all in it together. All humanities. And human beings, the only human beings, evolved beings, finally, that they can transcend. Because we have that finest uh, evolved neurophysiology within us. The, the, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the intellect, which allows us to transcend as opposed to other beings. That's why human life is very uh, precious. You know, you can transcend easily in, in that evolved state, whereas we don't, of course. You know, a lot of people just go on, like I told you, with the egoic way of living, and then that's why they come back over and over, birth mm -hmm. after birth after birth, right? But mm -hmm. you can uh, develop yourself in, you know, whenever you can, and by doing all these ritual, uh, all these uh, spiritual practices undertake, why do we do all that? eventually to connect right yeah that's what it is yeah. yeah thank you so much i don't know if i answered your question i think yes so. yes yeah absolutely <laughs> okay, okay. Vivek, uh, you have a question um you, you're asking me oh yes Vivek, please go ahead yes um thank you thank you for sure and for, for first of putting this together and thank you shadaji for uh for joining us. Uh, I'm Vivek Mittal, uh, normally based in London, but visiting parents in Delhi these days uh, by way of introduction. So in addition to all the great conversation, the Q&A that's happened, my question is about breath. Uh, how did your practice and breath help you along your journey? And the second part is, in your, in your experience or understanding, what happens when you are, uh, when, when, when you are uh, away from the body? What happens to the body? Is it does the body hold on to the last breath you took in and wait until you come back, or is there a way that the body just figures out how to carry on breathing uh, while while you're away? Um, first one was what? What was your first question? By the way, I'm sorry. H how has breath? Uh, how how oh, did breath, breath, breath. have role? Yeah, how did, uh, did breath have a role in your journey? Uh, oh, I see, I see. Um, <clears throat> how do I answer you that? Let's see here. Mm, nope, nope. Breath means, uh, well, normal breathing when you're uh, in the deep samadhi state, the ultimate samadhi states, you don't breathe anyway. It just, it sustains itself. You, you, it's like a kumbhaka state where you're not really breathing anymore. You know, everything, that energy, the prana sustains itself. You know, you heard uh, all these uh, way back in India, all these gurus, ears on, they meditate, you know? How do you think they just stay there, you know? In the caves or whatever. Because after stage, after a certain level of being in a samadhi state, you could just stay there in that absolute silence for a long time without breathing even, you know? You don't need to breathe. So breath doesn't have any impact after, after you get into a deeper level of understanding and deeper level of silence or stillness, I call it. You know, that, that quietude that you reach in the ultimate stages. 
you don't really breathe that much. So that to me, I never really paid attention to. I mean, if I may, because if, yeah, if, if I may interject there, the, you know, the moment I'm, you take a breath and you go into Samadhi, is it that same breath which was in your body when you come back? You, to, you release that breath when you come back. So the body is, you might be away for an hour, two hours, one day uh, in Samadhi. Uh, has the how does the body sustain itself in while whilst you're in samadhi? Now remember the breath is not just breathing oxygen. The breath you take, like pranayam, for example, you're taking a lot of prana, a vital force, right? That's in the universal consciousness. You're taking the vital force is what sustains you from living in this body. That's what gives the energy. That's what yeah. gives the movement. That stays the same. That remains, and in fact, that's gets more inside you after you get deeper and deeper into higher levels of consciousness. Meaning cool. when you reach the self-realization that stays with you all times, at all times. So breath in a normal living is okay. You're living in a better way, actually. Like I told you before in my talk, you yeah. are functioning far better now as opposed to before. Because of that breath, you have the vital force you have within you that is increased tremendously now. Your full potential is there now. You do anything you want. You can go and lift a big tree out there. You can do, if you put your mind to it, anything can come to its, uh, it can manifest, you know? So yeah, you live with that um, breath inside you and you function normally uh, in a normal way. In fact, you don't get sickness anymore. You don't get, uh, problems with the body is much better shape now you not uh you don't get uh flus and this and that like you used to because you have a lot more breath a lot more prana within you a lot more vital force within you that it takes care of itself all the energy centers it aligns perfectly in balance yeah you live, you live thank you very much Thank you. Thank you. Ajay, you were trying to uh, get your... Yeah, sorry. Uh, I've been sort of in and out. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shardaji, for a really wonderful uh, experience sharing. Uh, I'm in Delhi and, uh, you know, I've been at it for a couple of years. What, what really caught my attention was that you are extremely unconventional if I, if I may say so, because as was being discussed earlier, you've kind of gone through this in reverse. Uh, you know, most people go through the process of, uh, you know, learning and contemplation and then, you know, reflecting on it through Nididhyasana, whereas you seem to have kind of just by meditation without having to go through the whole jnana process, if you will. Uh, also, the fact that you are sharing this, uh, your experience with us, I mean, I've listened to a a few gurus, uh, I think they're enlightened, but they never talk about the fact that they're enlightened. And so you're the first person that I'm hearing who is sharing experiences of enlightenment, uh, which is kind of fascinating because, uh, I mean, I've never heard anyone kind of talk about it. So that's, that's, that's great. Uh, just a couple of questions. One is that uh, having now read the scriptures, uh, do you believe... Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on karma yoga uh, as something where what I understand of karma yoga is that you do action without uh, worrying yeah. about or without, you know, worrying about what the result might be. And it's a state of, of equanimity where you are neither happy nor sad. You don't have likes or dislikes. Uh, so what's your view on karma yoga from an enlightened sort of soul point of view, number one? And the second question is, uh, how do you differentiate uh, enlightenment with a mystic uh, experience? Because a lot of people I've heard, uh, they go through this, they're in a trance and they go into some sort of a mystic experience. So is there a, you know, how, do, how do you differentiate between those two experiences, if you will? Thank you. Oh, sure. Um, number one, uh, first question you said, uh, a lot of enlightened people don't say they're enlightened. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna answer that. <laughs> That I only do that because when I'm addressing uh, everybody, I have to say I've been through that process. I mean, there's no other term to use but to say self-realized 
or enlightenment, right? I mean, you know, that's the terms we use. Uh, I'm not here to boast I'm enlightened, therefore I'm doing this, nothing like that. It's, it doesn't phase me to, to say that. Uh, it doesn't thrill me uh, that, I'm, that I have gone through that and I'm by no means. I, I do that because so people will uh, understand why I'm coming from where I'm coming, you know, to giving the information is because of my direct experience. Uh, I had gone through all that for 10, almost 10 years, nine years. Um, so that information, my intention is, like I said earlier, to, to educate everybody else, whoever I can, like your group or next group or XYZ, whoever comes to me, I will do that. Maybe I'm meant to do that. That's why I'm doing it. Why would I do it otherwise? You know, I was not a writer. I'm not a speaker. I'm not uh, looking for praise or uh, uplifting other people uh, with devotees and accumulation. I'm not interested in any of those things. Uh, I live with my husband and I'm a quiet <laughs> so, a household a person just like you guys are, you know? Uh, so it's nothing to do with that. This is something uh, I do because, uh, I don't know, I, I love it. Uh, being interacting with different people, educating them, and they ask me questions. I'm giving information. That's about it. There is the matter for my, as far as that goes. And the second one you asked me was, I forgot now. Let me see. Yeah, the, the question was around karma yoga. I mean, does oh, karma right. yoga come first or does that come later? Right. Karma yoga is uh, like, uh, you know, do work that's given to you without any, any resource, which is good. That's exactly, we're already, a lot of people are already doing that. Maybe not a few handful look for uh, something in return. I don't know. But we're all karma yogis to begin with, like I was. I mean, I take care of my kit and kin. I take care of my husband. I do without anything, expecting them doing anything to me back. You know, that's us. It's almost like uh, it becomes a part of your life. You know, doing a karma yoga uh, is almost like playing your role well. Play your role that's given to you well. You know, that's karma yoga, right? I mean, you know, um, so I, in my case, I did that all along. Maybe that's another reason I transcended, I feel, because I always have done that. Always, whenever I do something, even when I was working in pharmaceutical company, I always make sure everything is perfect there. I know that's my way of doing. Uh, reaching perfection, reading, reaching things to do well, it's always been my thing. Maybe that also is part of, Thing that uplifts you or transcends you later on you know being that type of personality being that type of knowing understanding that what is that karma yoga really is all about and i never really thought about it in so many words but uh i always have done everything that i did okay uh without wondering what people are going to give me back i don't do that you know even when I make uh, help people out there, a lot of times I do a lot of charity work now. By the way, after self-realization, your priority is not about you any longer. It is that what I can do for somebody else, you know, they're in the boat, right. they're, they're struggling. There's so many issues you can, you can now address. And that's what I try to look for opportunities to do so. And that's what I spend my time now. Thank you. Um. Uh, I, I, I know, uh, VP, you may have, uh, I don't know if you have one more question. I have one towards the end. VP, would, would you like to go uh, with your question first? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Kishore. Um, so, Shadaji, I actually had two questions, but I'm so glad that Lakshmi asked one of them. It was regarding, you know, whether vegetarianism helps or not. Um, my second question is, uh, you know, uh, as Ajay was saying that you are quite unique in in the sense that you are a householder and you are enlightened. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, in your network or in your um, dealings, um, how many such other people are there? Is it very common or you feel you are sort of one of uh, the few ones who are still a householder and yet enlightened? I think I'm the only one that I know of in my circle of uh, families uh -huh. and friends that uh, had this opportunity or, or uh, uniqueness uh, of me going through this while I'm a householder, while I'm still in the family members, you know, while I'm functioning as a wife, as a mother, right. as a friend, mm -hmm. as a thing, you know, and I think that's very unique. And uh, 
Initially, like I told you, it's not an easy task for me. It's very difficult. I didn't emphasize that, by the way, enough. You know, I used to get depressed. I used to be sad, crying sometimes, myself without anybody knowing. You go through the stages of not wanting he to be here any longer after that, that experience, you know? It's like, uh, mm -hmm. what is there left for me to do still? What is that I have to still go through and wash my dishes? What is that I have to cook? What is that I have to take care of this physical still? You know, bathe, put on these things. And to me, everything is a job after that. Everything is a work, it feels, you know? Why is that I wanna do all this when I can just go away? My energy just, combines with the universal consciousness why can't I just be that way that type of a thought process goes through in my head even today at times but it's not an easy task it is uh, adjusting like I said a lot of integrating a lot of indulging yourself with other activities so you're not doing feeling bad all the time or, or depressed that's why you have to be active give out things to other people then you get that gratification at least that you're doing something for others and that itself lifts you up, you know, that kind of a feeling of uh, indulging yourself with helping others. And that's what I do now Beautiful. to make me feel Beautiful. better. Wonderful. I, I Kishore, if with your permission, may I just ask for one clarification? Please. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you said earlier in response to one of the questions uh, that there are no rules or regulation, but you have to do the meditation right. And... Uh, correctly is the word you use. So should we assume that because you were a meditator in your previous life, therefore it was very easy to for you to know how to do it correctly? Because I struggle with that a lot. And that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, and yep, yeah, uh, I would say so. Uh, I probably that's uh, perhaps is the reason I was able to do it right away and uh, uh, get in deeper and deeper level of uh, silence that uh, tranquility and that stillness, that's what we call, which is generated by meditation itself. I'm not putting any effort in it. It's called effortless effort, you know, uh, without mm. any force. That's what happens when you're a good meditator. You're not forcing it, you're not putting any effort into it. It will move you forward by itself. And that stage to come to, for you to come to that stage of, meditation it takes a lot of practice initially devotion and discipline without those three you won't move forward discipline means no matter what you're doing you have to put away some time for meditation you know you have to go in your silence you have to go by yourself away from everybody from tv this that chores get everything done that's what i used to do get everything done so people won't point out fingers at you oh you haven't done this oh you haven't cooked my dinner oh you haven't served me or kids calling you what have you it doesn't matter you know, take care of everything you need to do first, then you have that time for yourself. I used to stay up until one o'clock, two o'clock sometimes, even after my husband went to bed <laughs> to meditate because that was my hunger, my thirst. I won't sleep without meditation. I won't get up without meditation. That's how uh, eager I was those days uh, to, to come to, you know, to find out. And that's how I did it. So uh, no, there was no rules and regulations because uh, like I said, uh, everything sort of uh, told me from within. I, I didn't have mm -hmm. to participate in any rules or get up at three o'clock in the morning to meditate only. No, I didn't do that. I, I got up when I wa wanted to, six, seven, it doesn't matter. And then I meditate first. And then I used to eat breakfast. I don't eat anything until I meditate. I don't sleep with full stomach. I meditate after my dinner is done or before and give three hours gap, then I meditate before I sleep. Never never meditate with the full stomach. Never meditate when you're tired. Never meditate when you have too many activities pending to do. There are a lot of things you have to, you know, make pay attention to. <laughs> and also, <laughs> Thank and you also, so much. And also from the previous, of course, uh, being meditator in my previous life, that also perhaps helped me a lot, you know, uh, trying to get to that yeah, point. Yeah, no, that's what I was wondering, that whether you studied, because you did not have a guru, and you probably, from your comments, it seems like you were not reading any books or listening any audio tapes or anything of that sort. So yeah. how did you like easily got onto meditating it and 
getting it right uh, in, you know in your journey that's what yeah. I don't found very wrong. fascinating I, I, I later on in my doing my process I read hundreds of books because I was curious what other people did sure what that guru did what this guru did how did he get enlightened uh, my curiosity was to find out if my process and my my signposts are they similar to those or are they different. My curiosity was to read a lot of books to find out about them. I did that a lot. You should see my my room, my office full of books. I read so many books with different authors, different yogis, different uh, you know, Yogananda wrote beautiful books. I think. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Uh, I read David Hawkins, a lot of books on him. Uh, he's an enlightened uh, American, but God enlightened. Uh, what his issues that were, and a lot of books I read. Of course, Gita and all these I read to Bible. <laughs> Just to see, <laughs> I, all those things I read later when I was going through, not, not from the beginning. That's what I meant. You know, I'm not, I'm not right. uh, curious when I was growing up to, I didn't even know what enlightenment term was when I was growing up, believe me. And, or meditation was. I didn't pick up any of these things way into my adult life after I got married, everything. By the way, every individual has a time when you fulfill your role playing and when you're free of everything, when you have done it all, experienced it all, that will come to transcend. That's when you will turn around and, and it's time, that time you will know when it is. Perhaps that's my time. That's when it happened to me. Because my kids were grown. They're gone to colleges. You know, they're not there. Just my husband and I. I mean, he used to travel. My husband is a CEO of an ind and a company, an international company. So he used to travel a lot. I used to stay home. I said, no, no, you go ahead. I used to accompany him initially. And then I used to stay home because after I started doing this path, I have all that time to meditate all that time to do whatever I want. I don't have to worry about anybody. So I used to take advantage of that. <laughs> did a lot more meditations. That's what I did. That's how thirsty Great. I was. The drive was Thank so you. huge. Yeah, uh, Sharadaji, uh, unmistakably, there are uh, things that are in the, in the scriptures and you know in, in the various books that we read that you are touching upon one way or the other, you know, so I, I'm sure the group has uh, connected many different things as well. I have one last question. Uh, I know we are way over time. I, I really uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, I hope it's still okay. But this question um, is about a topic which we don't normally talk about, death. Um, and um, there's one interesting point that you may make in your book, which is that there are two times in, a, in a, that you have a chance to get enlightened, right? And or to be one with the, uh, with the, uh, the divine uh, consciousness. One is in deep meditation samadhi state. The other is just before the, um, the, the, the subtle body leaves the physical body. Right? There is that opportunity in that, that final, uh, there is a moment before what we call as death when when there is an opportunity there as well this is covered in the gita as well so i'm wondering if it is the same um you know so you know in the gita they talk about uh, shri krishna talks about the final thought before death so i'm uh, i'm curious about that and uh, uh, would, would you explain that final moment that you're talking about in your book yeah um yes i did mention that i remember come to think of it uh, when you're dead you know when you're dying uh you are in that absolute uh, but that doesn't count because while you're functioning if you're not transcended it won't count so you come back in the next next life and uh, continue on with the embodied life again okay um you do meet at the end point with the absolute yes the divine consciousness. Um, meeting divine consciousness has to be uh, done, like I said earlier, when you're like, I like, you know, in my case, for example, while you're functioning, it has to be there and uh, steadfast, it has to be. But uh, what exactly are you asking me? Is that the same you mean with the... No. Uh, is that, that is that opportunity you're saying that towards the end as well, when uh, in a person's life, there is that moment, but we cannot, we typically 
there's um, fear and there's other uh, right, uh, right. things that take over. Yeah, fear, fear is the main thing that takes care of people. Oh, what is this? I'm going someplace. So they don't think about when you, at least when you're passing away, if you're consciously thinking about divine, if you're a spiritual person to begin with all through life, you know, and be there, uh, that has a positive impact on you, how you come back in next life or whatever, at least, at least you are there. But a lot of people in the death time, they don't, they're mostly very confused and they go away. The spirit leaves, you know, uh, and, uh, and the body dead, of course, right? Uh, that doesn't happen to everybody, but few people do that. And another question that I didn't quite address about mystical uh, um, things somebody was asking me, I didn't uh, address that. Uh, what I wanna say about that is, yes, a lot of people go through outer body uh, situations and mystical uh, experiences a lot, you know, it doesn't mean you're self-realized. Those are not, they're temporary uh, spark. I would say, you know, of, of meeting the divine consciousness and then going back to regular consciousness again. Um, the thing is, you can't consider that as your self-realized or you, when you just because you have all these mystic uh, experiences. To be self-realized and you call yourself, your your fulfilled your, your task of reaching the goal of divine consciousness is when the communion with divine is continuous. You know what I'm saying? It's always there, that conscious. Let's say you, you take a bath, or you're taking a shower, you close your eyes for a minute, you can still feel that energy. You can feel that absolute silence. You're for a moment, you're always there. You're living with that consciousness, living with that divine essence. You're no longer back and forth switching into the old way of being and, and you know, there's no more ego naturally. Ego is subservient to you now. It, it's there, it's not completely washed off, but it, it doesn't have any impact any longer because your driver, you're a new driver now. You have yourself driving your life now. Your true essential nature, divine nature is driving your life, moving you forward the rest of your life. So that's the big difference. And uh, that consciousness you live with. And uh, uh, like I said, communion has to be steadfast and continuous to call yourself your self-realized. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I think we have exceeded our time. I hope uh, most of the questions have been answered. I mean, as you pointed out, they can reach out to you through your through email. Uh, yeah. I, you know, we really appreciate you taking your time, Sardaji. This was uh, fascinating um, and completely uh, um, fantastic uh, talk today. And especially the uh, question and answers were very enlightening, I would say. So um, thank you so much for taking your time today. Um, we appreciate it. And uh, yeah, on behalf of the entire group, thank you. Thank you so much. I thank you all. It's a pleasure meeting you all. Actually, I love meeting new people and I love talking to new people. That's another interest I have. Like uh, uh, Priti has said, yes, I look forward for meeting new people always. So it's, it's I don't know, it's my, I like it a lot. And I hope we can meet you sometime, all of you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Hi, Sharda. How are you? Hello. Hi, how are you? Venkatesh, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I was just listening to the conversation. Just fabulous. Fabulous. And oh, the questions. I didn't know you were there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I did join a little later, but uh, fantastic questions and such a yeah. lovely conversation. Very wow. Nice. It's nice seeing you, Venkatesh. <laughs> There's Same your friend. Yeah. There's a lot to show me. Yeah, he organized this Zoom today. I think I told you that, right? And yes, group, yes uh, he did. And Venki is the reason I came to know Shardaji as well. Uh, so. Yeah, right. You didn't know which Venki, and then I had to tell you that he talks to you. <laughs> 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 He's the one who told me about you. <laughs> awesome. Very nice. Thank you so much. I, I met some fantastic groups, believe me, to Venkatesh and to other people. And uh, you guys are one of them. Very cool. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank Bye. Thank you. Bye. Venkatesh, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. <clears throat> yes, sure. Did you find out if we're meeting tomorrow with Rajan and them? Did you find? Did you talk to Ritesh? Uh, not yet. Yeah. I'll check with Ritesh and then. And let me know. I'll let you know. Yep. yep. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.